let's get started. Um, so today we're happy to have Matthew Tanchik here. He is a, a PhD student at UC Berkeley and he did his master's at MIT, has worked a lot on computational photography, computer graphics, computer vision, and very recently on uh, view synthesis, he has developed with his co-authors the neural radi radiance field approach that most of us are familiar with, and very recently the um, uh, more theoretical insights into the Fourier features for um, all kinds of applications. So I'm very much for, uh, looking forward to your talk, Matt. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thanks for the intro. Um, so I'm Matt. I'm a second year PhD student at Berkeley and my advisor is Rin Ung. And I want to thank you all for giving me this chance to give this talk today. I've always been a big fan of a lot of the work that you guys do. Um, now feel free to ask questions as I go. There'll be time at the end, as mentioned, for additional questions. So in this talk, I wanna go over two projects. The first is NERF, which is a view synthesis method that uses neural radiance fields. And then the second is the follow-up work that investigates some of the observations in NERF. This is joint work with a number of collaborators. Most of us are from Berkeley, with the exception of John Barron from Google and Robbie Robin Morthy from UCSD. I wanna quickly highlight Ben Mildenhall and Patul Srinivasan, who both contributed significantly to both of these works. So first I'll talk about NERF, which is representing scenes as neural radiance fields for view synthesis. There's been a lot of recent progress in using deep learning for novel view synthesis. We're able to produce pretty incredible photorealistic content from sparsely sampled imagery. For this talk, I'm gonna focus on the specific problem of view interpolation. This is where you get multiple input views of a given real world scene, along with the corresponding camera poses and then you use them to render photorealistic new views of that same scene that interpolate between the given views. This is where the remote presentation may start to break down a little bit. So on the left, you should see jerkiness between, with like large pixel shifts between the inputs, and then hopefully on the right, the video looks smooth. This video includes the interpolated views that are being synthesized. If the right video does not look smooth, you'll just have to take my word for it. Um, and also all these videos are posted online. So now that we have this problem statement, how do we solve it? So at a high level, an approach that has been very successful so far is to essentially take your set of images and then use them to predict a 3D discrete volume representation, such as a voxel grid. You can then render new views by compositing along the rays. A lot of the recent successful methods can be roughly described in this way. So this includes methods like Soft3D, which were state-of-the-art prior to deep learning, and they use traditional stereo methods to estimate an RGB alpha volume. Recent work in multi-plane images, or MPIs, can also be thought of in this way. Since they're essentially a estimate of a particular frustrum-shaped layer RGB alpha representation that uses classic alpha comp composition along the rays in order to render new views. Other cool works like neural volumes use the strategy to learn these like cool little dynamic 3D videos. So this successful strategy for photorealistic view synthesis combines machine learning with, the, with traditional RGB alpha volume rendering models. These discrete grid-based representations are really easy to integrate into 3D scene and pipelines since you can unproject each image out into a voxel grid and then run a 3D CNN to predict the RGB alpha voxel grid. The alpha composition operation used for rendering is trivially differentiable and it plays nicely with gradient based optimization. So the 3D CNN networks can just be trained on how well they render out the held out views. This is great for optimization, but you start to get a really bad scaling property as the res resolution increases. This gets even worse for some of the state-of-the-art algorithms which use multiple 3D grids to represent the larger scale scene. And it's not uncommon for these to use multiple gigabytes just to represent a single scene. 
Now, thanks in part to you all, there's a totally different approach for representing 3D content that's been gaining a lot of traction. In this case, we have a neural network that represents the shape by encoding a continuous function in three-dimensional space. Here we have a visualization of one version of that idea where the underlying function is a continuous occupancy field. So the function should be zero for all points outside of the object, like this bench in this case, and then the value one for all points inside. Now, by supervising it with ground truth occupancy, you end up with a shape representation that is the network itself. Representing shapes as occupancy is just one option. You can do other underlying continuous functions like sign distance fields, like in deep SDF. Um, however, they all share this common attribute that the shape itself is restricted to be on a surface, which exists as a level set of the network. So in order to extract and render the 3D object, you essentially have to find a bunch of zero crossings in the network itself. So most of these methods supervise with ground truth 3D information, which isn't quite usable for view synthesis. However, more recently, there have been methods that use networks with images as input, um, but they have to differentiate through an iterative zero crossing solver in order to figure out where the surface is located for each ray. So far, this process is easy to, dif or is not as easy to differentiate as volume rendering. And this arises from the fact that they have to represent the shape as a surface of a instead of a volume. But the compression benefit is huge. You can save, as you can see, like between 10 to 1,000 times um, more efficient compared to a volume-based representation. And this is great because uh, these, these voxel grid representations are too big, and that's really a bottleneck for those methods. So in this project, our core idea was to combine the benefits of both these methods. So we use a neural network instead of a voxel grid to encode a volumetric representation of the scene. And then when we want to render new views, we use the same volume rendering style that has achieved these great results in the past. So these are the key details I want to cover in this talk for NERF, and I'll expand each in turn. So starting with the first one, uh, let's take a look at how we represent the scene as a fully connected neural network. So we can represent any arbitrary scene as this network, which in this case is just nine layers and 256 channels. So I think this ends up being around five megabytes. So it's a pretty small network. The network then takes in a continuous 5D coordinate containing the 3D location XYZ along with the 2D viewing angle theta and phi, and then it outputs the volume density sigma, which can be thought of as the opacity at that location, as well as the RGB value representing the radiance emitted from a particle at that input location along the viewing direction. So in contrast to previous work with volume representations, here we're just fitting a continuous function approximator to the volume without ever instantiating a grid of individual samples. This is a pretty big deal because it allows us to trivially add more dimensions without incurring any extra storage cost. If we wanted to do that with these traditional representations, uh, adding those extra dimensions would be prohibitively expensive. But in NERF, we can do this almost for free by just appending a few extra numbers to our input to our network. And then the network can decide how to allocate the capacity to represent the important parts of the function. So let's take a look at how the rendering model is used to synthesize new views from this representation. To render each image from the scene, we need to estimate how much light of each color makes it out of the volume along each camera ray. So here's a visualization where we have two images of this Lego bulldozer. And to render each of these views, we query the network at a bunch of discrete points along the path for each ray. These are then fed through a network and the output, the corresponding colors and volume densities are output, which are then composited along the ray to compute the single uh, color. So we can take a closer look at how this rendering works. Um, so to compute the color for any camera ray that passes through the volume, we need to estimate the 1D 
line integral along that ray. And we do this with a pretty simple approach where we just query the MLP at a bunch of samples like this. And then we use a quadrature estimate from traditional volume rendering to estimate its continuous integral. So this will compute the color C of any camera ray as the sum of contributions from each segment of the ray through the volume. And each segment's contribution is the segment colors C sub i weighted by an estimate of the transmission T sub i. This computes how much light is blocked before reaching that segment. And finally, it's also multiplied by this alpha i, which is the amount of light emitted by the segment. And this is a function of the segment's length, delta t sub i, and its estimated volume density, sigma. This is essentially the same as the opacity of the segment. So at first glance, this parameterization may look different than standard alpha compositing that you may be used to, but they're actually pretty similar in practice. And this is essentially a continuous analog of alpha compositing. So most of the previous methods for view synthesis use discrete volumes as a volume rendering model where the opacity is directly parameterized as alpha. This implies that there's a constant step size, but that doesn't really matter since in the cases they're interested in, the output voxel grids have a fixed resolution anyways. But in our case, we specifically changed the output scalar to sigma, which is often referred to as an extinction coefficient or a differential volume density at each point in space. And then using sigma instead of the standard alpha is crucial because in our continuous representation, it allows us to render images where the distance between these points is no longer fixed like they are in a standard voxel grid. So despite the fact that we learn a continuous representation of the scene, the resolution of our model is still limited by two main factors. The first is just the resolution of the input images, which we really can't do anything about unless you get a better camera. And then the second is limited by how finely we sample the points along the ray. Now, if we dig into that a little bit deeper, you can imagine that the best solution would be to sample very densely. However, this can be really slow because this basically requires passing each sample through the network. So to make this a little bit more efficient, we do a two pass hierarchical volume rendering, which increases our effective learned resolution given a fixed sampling budget. So in the first round, we just sample regularly um, in, in regularly simple, sampled uh, like linear points along the ray. And then we can calculate the accumulated color using the equation that I previously described. And if you remember, the accumulated color is just a weighted sum of each segment's colors. So if we normalize the per sample color weights, we can treat them as a probability distribution. Um, and this tells us roughly about how much each location contributed to the final color. Then we can compute a second set of sample points simply by drawing these additional samples from this probability distribution. This means that we'll get more sampling precision around the object boundaries where the opacity goes from low to high. And this is where we want the, uh, the more samples because we don't really want to do extra samples in free space, nor do we want extra samples in the object itself. So this strategy has a similar feel to important sampling since we're trying to approximate an integral and we're doing fewer samples by more intelligently allocating the samples to where we expect them to actually contribute to the underlying integral. This isn't a perfect solution since our core samples still need to be packed tightly enough to hit the fine details. However, we find in practice that given a given like sampling budget, this strategy seems to always outperform just one round of linear sampling. So another significant difference between our model and the models more typical in view synthesis methods is that we allow the color of each of any 3D point to vary as a function of the viewing direction. This is why we refer to the learned function as a radiance field, as it represents a continuous field of particles in 3D space that emit light. And the radiance emitted by each particle is a function of the 2D input. So our representation can also be thought of as like a volumetric version of surface light fields, which represent the scenes of meshes with view dependent emitted light. If we manipulate the directional inputs, 
while keeping the XYZ locations fixed, we can visualize what like we can visualize what view dependent effects are encoded by the network. So, so here's a visualization of this idea for two different uh, rendered synthetic models. And what we're doing is we're visualizing the different view directions here, given a fixed XYZ location. So in one case, it's on the ship, in the other case, it's in the water. And what we see is that as you rotate in these two cases, you get these specular highlights that appear and the corresponding colors um, at those points also show these specular lobes. So we're able to capture this view dependent effect. Okay, so now let's take a look at how you would actually optimize one of these NERF networks. If we go back to the expression for the accumulated color along each ray, it's clear that the final computed color is trivially differentiable with respect to the color and volume density at each sample. And therefore, it's also differentiable with respect to the parameters of the network that outputs the colors and volume densities. So this lets us optimize the network's parameters by using stochastic gradient descent just to minimize the rendering error of the, the network along with the input images. So to put this in context, suppose we have a set of input images distributed hemispherically around an object like this. At each training iteration, we'll just choose one of those images and render the nerf from that camera pose and then take a gradient step on the L2 loss, comparing the rendered output with the ground truth training image. Then over the course of training, the simple multi-view consistency will encourage the network to allocate volume density, allocate high volume density along with accurate colors at the locations where the surfaces actually exist in the underlying scene. So that was a lot of description. Um, I think it's useful to take a look at some results. So these are all real world results where I th the number of images varies from, I think around 15 up to 60 or 70. As you can see, we can capture realistic like transparencies and reflections, um, these fine details. Here's another example of reflections. It also works for like large scenes and here's a smaller scene. And it also works for 360 uh, real world scenes. May, may I ask a quick question? Um, so this is super impressive results. I assume like this two stage sampling is important to get like all the, the fine details for the, like, for the image synthesis. Uh, like when you do the training, however, like in the beginning, the network doesn't know the geometry, right? So um, it seems like the sampling procedure that you describe will not yield useful samples, maybe. Does it still converge even for like this, this first core step samples, like, um, like non-uniform, like maybe non-uniformly in space? Um, yeah, so, so in the first, the first core samples are uniformly spaced, um, but then we randomly like shift them forward and backwards so that during training, it can kind of see the whole space. And what we really just require is that this uniform first sampling that each point like hits the object at least once um, or is around the object because you sort of create this like, you can think of the sampling rate as creating sort of a cloud around where the object actually exists. And then the second stage really, uh, tightens that to the actual shape of the object. Um, so in practice, I think we do for these scenes, I think it was like 128 samples in the first stage and then an additional 128 in the second. And it seems but to work all, pretty all well. All these two stages are always part of the optimization from the start. There's no bootstrapping or something. No, it, it, we, we use them both at the start. Okay, right, thanks. Um, maybe related to this, you, you use two networks, right? For the hierarchical sampling, two different networks. Um, no, we use the same network. We just sample, we just put in different locations for where oh, we sample I see. it. Oh, okay. Then maybe I got it wrong in the code. Okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, we find that this idea outperforms prior work. 
that have, has also tried to represent scenes as continuous functions that are encoded by MLPs. And so here's an example in synthetic data. And we can see that the scene representation networks or SRNs um, are unable to represent the same level of detail. And their representation is also not consistent between viewpoints since they use a recurrent network to march rays through the representation. So we can see the same difference on real data where the nerve is able to represent these higher details on the objects. We also find that it's more consistent across views compared to our group's prior work called lo local light field fusion. Um, this was a blend between multiple MPI res representations due to limitations in the range of views that can be rendered from each MPI. And then finally, we also find that we're able to represent more detailed content compared to the state-of-the-art neural volumes work that uses a single sampled volume. However, it's limited by the discrete resolution. So here are some more synthetic scene examples. And for each of these, we render 100 inputs, input images that are used to create a nerve to synthesize a full hemisphere of inward facing views. It's worth emphasizing that this is pretty difficult in practice because if you think about how many images you'd actually need for a full micro sampling, it'd be orders and orders and orders and more magnitude more images. So the fact that we can do this with only 100 images with these view dependent effects is we think pretty impressive. Um, here we can do a similar visualization to that ship that I was showing earlier with the view dependent effects. And here what we're doing is on the left, we're just doing the standard rendered views for um, different camera angles. And then on the right, we're fixing the camera location to be fixed. And then we're changing the view directions based on the camera on the left. And this allows us to see the view dependent effects that the network has learned. So these are like the specularities in the TV and on the table. And we can do the same for any of our scenes. So here's another one of a stove and we can see the reflection on the metal of the stove is changing with the different angles. We can also visualize the geometry that's represented by the NERF by computing the expected termination depth within each volume uh, of each ray. And this essentially computes a depth map for the volume and visualizing these demonstrate that the NERF representation from images alone is able to represent this detailed geometry. Uh, we're even able to resolve really fine details, uh, like in this case, which has fine occluders, which are typically problematic for standard depth estimation algorithms. And this is cool because it shows that the NERF is not just strictly useful for view synthesis and that the underlying 3D information that's recovered is better than you might expect uh, because the training loss forces there to be a multi-view consistency between all of the input views. We can use this detailed geometry to augment scenes with virtual objects and render accurate occlusion effects. So here we're just inserting a little ball and as you can see as it moves along a 3D path the uh, occlusions are pretty convincing. So even though we use a volumetric representation of the scene, the NERF seems to learn a geometry representation that corresponds to the actual surfaces. And it doesn't just dim distribute opacity throughout the scene like a fog, which happens to some other um, view synthesis methods. And so we can kind of visualize this by trying to invert the final uh, volume into a, a mesh by doing a marching cubes. And we can see that we can produce a pretty detailed mesh geometry. So here's a little toy bulldozer. So going forward, I think there's a lot of interesting issues to address. One of the big downsides to NERF is that the training and inference time is really slow. So training for a single scene takes about half a day and then rendering a single frame takes about 30 seconds. So this is mostly because when you render each frame, the number of queries a network has to make is really large. Um, or I think a one megapixel image ends up being almost a quarter billion queries. So it's almost impressive that we have architectures that can do this in 30 seconds now. Um, though it's worth noting that during inference time, we have a lot better idea of where the actual content is so we can be smarter about how we allocate those samples. 
So anecdotally, we find that just limiting the queries to a coarse hole around the object can speed up the rendering by almost an order of magnitude. However, this is just a preliminary result, and we think that with further investigation, you could really impact the uh, training and inference speed, which would be very useful for a model like this. So another cool direction is to extend the nerf representation to enable more graphics functionality. So right now we can just render a new scene, new views of the scene. But what we really want is to take photos and then recover full graphic assets that can be composed into scenes or relit or manipulated. Um, and then finally, there's generalization. So it's a little unfortunate that for each scene, we have to retrain the whole network. Um, you would imagine that if you've trained multiple networks over multiple scenes, that you might be able to train it on a newer scene with fewer images or potentially do something uh, in only inference time. And I think this might be another good place to quickly pause to see if there are any questions before I move into the next project. Um, just basically more or less a repetition of the previous question. Um, because in the paper, it's ex explicitly stated that there are two separate networks, um, one coarse and one fine, and with, with different objectives. And now I'm more confused. Okay, I may, I may be misremembering that fact. Um, we okay. played around with a bunch of different uh, versions. I, I'm slightly blanking on which one we ended up with. Um, but it is possible that we had a coarser network. However, if you do render the images from each with each of these methods, you, you, you're still trying to reconstruct the whole volume. It's just one won't produce quite as sharp results. I see. So do you have any, any ideas on like reducing training and inference time? Because in, in the end, like if you want to go to find resolution, you need to do all these queries, right? So you, you might want to have a more, maybe more intelligent sampling strategy that leads you faster to your goal maybe. But as soon as you go to higher resolution images, you need to render millions of pixels and query your volume many, many times, right? Right. There, there's two dimensions here, though. One is you have to obviously query for each pixel. But then the question is, how many times do you query along that ray? And right. the number of times you query along that ray, you can use heuristics to really sample the places where you actually care about. Because if you're uh, not smart about it, you end up querying a lot of empty free space or space that has already happened after the occluder, which right. um, if you think about it, like as you're querying, you get an idea of how much you've accumulated and really what you should do is stop querying after you fully accumulated the color. Um, and so then trying to implement these things in practice uh, is where some of the challenges arise, because if you want it then to be efficient on GPUs, you might need to start creating some custom CUDA kernels or who knows what <laughs> or so for, this, for this high high resolution results you showed the end like the real scenes like do you remember roughly like how many queries i mean in the order of how many queries you need per ray uh so in those scenes we're doing 256. oh okay so it's always fixed yeah so we use the same during training versus test um, but since then we found that like i mentioned we were able to do about 10 times fewer queries and get equivalent results by being a little bit smarter about where we query. Okay. Um, you can also imagine trying to turn these into like SDFs or something, another data structure that allows you to query faster. Mm -hmm. Super, thanks. Okay, I think I'll continue and we can obviously ask more questions about this at the end. So there was one extra little trick with NERF that I have not mentioned yet which is that we manipulated the input coordinates in order to represent these uh, high frequency details. And so if you implement what I've described so far with a standard MLP, you end up getting these kind of blurry results. They don't look terrible, but as you can see, the, you don't really see the details in the leaves. However, our final results do have these details. So, Interestingly, this is a problem where ner networks output blurred representations. Uh, and it's not specific to view synthesis or 3D representations. It's actually more representative of a general challenge of getting networks to represent these high frequency functions. 
So to illustrate this issue, we can drop to this toy problem where we just have a simple network that takes in an XY location and then outputs an RGB. And then what we wanna do is just memorize a 2D image. Now we'd think this would be super simple because networks are, as we're told, universal function approximators. However, when you train this, you end up getting these images that are not particularly sharp. And this is kind of surprising because at least in this case, the network has eight times as many parameters as the image has pixels. So that's a little bit disappointing. However, we find that we can achieve higher frequency outputs just by mapping the input coordinates to a higher dimensional space by encoding them with a set of sinusoids with exponentially increasing frequency. When we apply this mapping to the same task, we can see that we're able to recover uh, images that are much closer to the ground truth. So even though our real task is different than the simple function memorization, since we're indirectly supervising through a volume, we find that applying this to our 5D input coordinates really improves the results. So the question becomes why? Um, this really surprised us and we felt like we needed to try to understand a little bit better. And that's what motivated us to follow up with this paper that we recently put up on archive about using Fourier features to let networks learn high frequency functions in low dimensional domains. So just to set the problem up, just like before, we have an input coordinate that we pass through an MLP to output values. And now we're inserting this input mapping between the input coordinates and the MLP. Now in the NERF case, it was just a set of exponentially spaced lines and cosines. So to explain the effects of the positional encoding, we draw heavily on recent work that shows that deep neural networks can be approximated with kernel regression using neural tangent kernels, or NTKs. I'll unpack this a bit more, but the main points I want to touch on are that first, NTKs effectively used in a standard fully connected network are poorly suited for the problem setting of regressing high frequency functions in low dimensional domains. The sinusoidal input mapping, like positional encoding, transforms the NTK to be better suited for these tasks. Furthermore, we can tune the parameters of this mapping to manipulate the NTK to converge improve its convergence and generalizations for specific tasks. And then finally, we can use these observations to let us generalize the positional encoding used in NERF to prescribe a simple strategy that can be used in similar problem settings where you want to use these fully connected networks in low dimensional, with low dimensional inputs. So first I'll talk about how we can understand the function learned by a deep neural network as a kernel regression predictor and then how Fourier feature mapping changes the effective kernel used by the network. As a quick review, kernel regression is a classic nonlinear regression algorithm, which you can think of at a high level as constructing a continuous function from observed discrete points using kernel functions, which describe the similarity between the input points. The kernel regressor f hat here ends up just being a weighted sum of the training labels y, where the weights are computed using this kernel or similarity function k between each continuous point and each of the training points x sub i. There has been an exciting line of work that shows how deep networks can be approximated by kernel regression. Most of this work falls under the uh, umbrella of neural tangent kernel theory. And this approximation holds in the limit of infinitely wide networks trained with infinitely small gradient steps. But many of these findings have been shown to also apply to more practical regimes. So this line of work says that deep networks can learn a function that can be approximated as a kernel regression with a specific neural tangent kernel that is determined by the network's architecture and the network's weight initialization. So the NTK literature has precisely derived and expressed this kernel, but I won't go into that, that here, nor do I think I would give it justice. But the one thing to note is that the NTK kernel or similarity is a function of the dot product between two vectors. In our case, this is between the two input points. So our feature mappings are a way to change the network's kernel function by transforming the input. The question then becomes, what happens to the resulting composed NTK? 
We can start with the sinusoidal feature mapping, which we refer to as a Fourier feature mapping. And note that this is a more general form of the mapping used in NERF. So in this mapping, V is the input, for example, the X, Y, Z coordinates. The Bs are a frequency matrix, and then the As are the amplitudes of the sinusoids. So in the NERF case, the As would have just been one, and then the Bs would have been powers of two, where the components are just on the diagonals. Since the NTK is a dot product kernel, we can think about how the dot product of two input points uh, behaves after it's been transformed with these feature Fourier feature mappings. So a simple trig identity shows that the dot product between two feature mapped points is just the cosine of the difference between these two points. Now this is often referred to as a stationary or a shift invariant kernel. This observation has been used a lot in kernel methods of the past, um, particularly in the random Fourier feature technique by Rahimi and Recht. This is important because the full neural tangent kernel is now stationary. It's a, compo it's a composition of the previous NTK with the stationary H function uh, due to the feature mapping. As a result, we can think of the function represented by the network as a convolution between this composed NTK with weighted Dirac deltas at each of the training points locations. I think it can be useful to visualize the NTK with and without the Fourier feature mapping. So on the left, we're looking at the NTK for a standard MLP uh, with evenly spaced points in 1D. Each axis is a plot of the X value and then each row is a plot of the similarity between the corresponding x coordinate with the x coordinates between minus 0.5 and 0.5. So it's pretty clear that the standard NTK has quirks that are pretty weird in low dimensions. So for one, it's clearly not stationary as it significantly changes between different x coordinates. So the relative influence of neighboring points changes across the input domain. Additionally, for any row, the largest value is not along the diagonal. And this means that the predicted function value at some points in space aren't most influenced by the labels at that same location. Now on the right, we see something very different. Here we're just applying a simple sine and cosine to our input. And what we see is that the kernel is now stationary since each row is just a shifted version of each other's row and the strongest values are along the diagonal. So here's a pretty simple experiment that shows why this is important in practice. In this experiment, we just have a 1D uh, input 1D coordinate from just minus pi to pi, and then we're trying to regress these functions. And in this case, it's just a Gaussian. Now, if I were to regress this Gaussian, or if I were to shift it, um, what we'd want in practice is for them to perform roughly the same. And what we see is that with our mapping, regardless of how you shift the input, we get constant performance across the space. Now, if you don't use that mapping, we see that if the Gaussian is centered around zero, we perform significantly better than if it has been shifted. And this seems undesirable because if I were, if you think about that like 2D regression task where I was just taking the uh, pixel coordinate and regressing the image, if I just shift this image around, I'd expect it to perform roughly the same. However, this is showing us that it very much won't because the kernel is not stationary. And speaking of that 2D task, here's some examples of um, when you don't add the mapping versus when you add just a single layer of a stationary mapping. So as you can see, the results improve. However, it's still not quite as good as what we'd want. So the question becomes, how do we tune this kernel to um, provide the best results for the problems that we're interested in. So we can take another look at our mapping. And what we can do is we can modify these amplitudes and frequencies, right? So here we're plotting an NTK for one such parameterization that is controlled by this parameter P here. And in this parameterization, we have the full Fourier basis of frequencies. And then what we're varying is that the, these amplitudes and we're varying them such that they drop off for higher frequencies at a rate that's proportional to P. The details of this parameterization are not super important, and they can be found in the paper. 
However, what is important is that we can see that we can vary the fall off of the resulting NTKs in the spatial and the Fourier domain. So for example, in this case, we see that with lower values of P, um, it results in an NTK kernel that has relatively more high frequencies. This ability to control the NTK's Fourier space fall off ends up being really important. So one of the interesting results that has come out of the recent prior work on NTK theory is that the convergence properties of training deep networks are very well characterized by the eigenvalue spectrum of the network's corresponding NTK kernel. I won't go into the details now, but in this problem setting, in the problem setting we consider, the NTK eigenvalue is just eigenvalue spectrum is just the Fourier spectrum. And in this recent work, they essentially say that the networks will converge faster to represent the frequency frequencies that have powers in the NTK spectrum. So to go into again a little more experimentally. Here we just have a, a network that's trained to regress this black function. And we can see that the networks with different NTKs converge to pretty different functions. Now remember that the mappings with larger values of P mean that the NTKs have a faster fall off, faster Fourier fall off. And we can see that the, as P increases, the learned function becomes lower and lower frequencies. So when P is zero, our function is pretty high frequency. And if we split up the training loss for different frequencies, we can see that the convergence rates differ for each mapping. And this is in line with what the NTK theory provides. As I mentioned earlier, networks converge faster to represent components of functions that correspond to the eigenfunctions of their NTKs with larger eigenvalues. And interestingly, we can see that the network without a mapping behaves like a very, very low frequency kernel and this helps explain the phenomenon we see in practice where the standard networks converge to high frequencies so slowly that they're pretty much unusable um, for these applications. And now if we look at the test and train loss for all the frequencies, we can see why it's important to choose a Fourier feature mapping that has the Fourier space fall off of the function you're trying to represent. So in this case, the green or the P equals one curve uh, best fits our um, underlying distribution. Whereas if you have too many high frequencies, you're going to overfit. And if you have too few, you're going to underfit. And here's a 2D example of the exact same phenomenon. On the right, we have a slice of the 1D NT, or a 1D slice of the NTK for different mapping parameters. And on the left, we have just the image reconstruction. As we can see, as we tune the bandwidth of the NTK kernel, we can transition from this underfitting to this overfitting regime. So given these observations, how should we choose a mapping in practice? Now, in these previous examples, I've assumed that we've had the full Fourier basis of frequencies and that we were just modifying the amplitudes. However, this is impractical in as the sampling rate and the input dimension increases because the input mapping would then become massive. So unfortunately, this is the regime that we're interested in. So instead, we use random sampling of frequencies from a parametric distribution. This is similar to what Rahimi and Recht do in the random Fourier features work, if you're familiar with that. Additionally, we set the amplitudes of each sinusoid to just be a constant, which we find in practice um, the random features play a much larger role, especially when you consider using op an optimizer like Adam. So then the question becomes, how do you choose what distribution to sample the frequencies from? Now, interestingly, we find that the precise distribution doesn't really matter compared to the bandwidth. In this experiment, we're just training uh, networks to fit three different target functions that are sampled from different uh, data distributions. And then our Fourier feature mappings are frequencies that are sampled from these four different uh, distributions and then labeled in different colors. On the y-axis, we have the loss. And then on the x-axis, axis, we have the standard deviation of the randomly sampled frequencies in the mapping. Now, what's interesting is that the type of distribution doesn't really seem to matter as they all follow the same curve. The performance can be fully predicted by the standard deviation of the sample points. This is pretty good news since it suggests that we don't really need to bother with trying different distributions. 
So our suggestion is that people just sample frequencies from an isotropic Gaussian whose scale has been chosen by a simple parameter sweep over a validation set. I think it's often nice to see what the corresponding code looks like, particularly in this case, since it shows the simplicity of the method. So before you would just take your input coordinate and then you'd pass it into your network and then everything else happens. What we're proposing is the addition of two lines where one, you're sampling frequencies from a Gaussian distribution. And then the second thing you're doing is you're multiplying your input coordinates by a matrix of those frequencies and then taking the sine and the cosine of those values, concatenating them and then passing it through. And as you can see, we're introducing two parameters, one, two new parameters. One is the scale, which we just discussed. And in practice, the best way to find this is after you train your network, if your results are too low frequency, you can increase the scale. If you start getting these, this high frequency noise, you can then decrease the scale. And then the second is the number of features. And this is how many frequencies you want your input mapping to have. And we find that as you increase this, it never really gets worse. However, the marginal benefit decreases over time. So really, it's just a matter of making this as large as you want while keeping in mind that it increases the size of your first layer. So there's a little bit of a computational cost to it. And we can take a look at the results. So here are the 2D image memorization I was showing earlier. However, now I have this isotropic Gaussian mapping, uh, the Fourier feature mapping. And we can see that the reconstructed images essentially look like ground truth. And the same is true for other image domains. So here is text. And what's kind of cool in this case is you can't, some of these like small words just completely disappear without having the correct mapping. Uh, we see the same thing for 3D shape regression. So this is similar to like an occupancy net style uh, model where we're just saying if it's one inside the object to zero outside and then adding this mapping, we're able to uh, recover these fine details on the mesh. And then we also find that this helps with indirectly supervised tasks, uh, tasks like CT and MRI, and then of course NERF, given that NERF was the motivation of this work to begin with. And in the paper itself, we go into a little bit uh, more details of how, what the indirect supervision and, uh, does and how that changes the, uh, the math. So in summary, we found that a simple Fourier feature mapping enables us to tune the NLP's NTK so that it's able to converge to represent high frequencies that are important to the types of functions that are relevant in computer graphics and vision. But we think one interesting avenue to explore is finding out whether this could be applicable to other domains. So for example, a similar technique might be used to pack more high frequency variations into low dimensional latent spaces which could be used for generative models. I think another interesting question is whether the same benefit could be captured by different network architectures. So a recent paper out of Stanford uses a network architecture they called Siren, which has a sinusoidal activation uh, for each layer, and they're able to uh, perform well on similar low dimensional tasks. And I think it'd be interesting to investigate how the, these two ideas connect and what they're uh, relationship to each other are. And I believe that the, one of the authors is actually giving a talk uh, during the seminar next week. So that should be interesting. Now, I wanted to quickly highlight the other collaborators on this project because this is by no means my own work, but really the work of all of us. And I wanted to thank you for listening. Now, the each of these projects has its own project website where you can find the code and uh, paper. And in the case of NERF, there's also videos in case the videos did not turn out well over Zoom. And thank you. And I guess now if there's any additional questions. Thank you, Matt. This was uh, really exciting work.